gRPC is a sort of alternative to REST for managing communication between services. But what's the catch? Why is not everyone using this? In this video, I'm going to explain what gRPC is, how it relates to the, dare I say, classic REST interface. Actually, this video turned out to be much harder than I thought, but I think I understand now why most people aren't using gRPC. Now, before I dive into gRPC, I first want to talk about REST. And I created a little example here that has a couple of different services. So there's an analytics service, there's an encoding service, and there is a web client. So these are three different things. And I'm using RESTful interfaces here. So the way that this works, I'm not going to run this complete example, it's purely for illustration, is that we have an analytics service, which is, as you can see here, a fast API app. And that works with the SQLite database. And I'm using SQL Alchemy in this particular example. And the thing that this service does is that this is a simple analytics service where we can post logging requests. So we have an analytics table that has entries with IDs and video names. So this is for a video service. And then when I scroll down, you see that I have some logging functionality built in here. So the main thing that this exposes is a log view. Let me make this a bit wider. And mainly what this does is that it logs an incoming request for a particular video name. And then from that, it creates a new entry in the database. That's the only thing this does, purely used for logging. Now there's a second service here, which is the encoding service. And the interesting thing here is that this is actually not using Python, but a different programming language, Go. Now, I won't dive deep into Go here because this is not a Go video, though I might do a video about Go in the future pretty soon. But as you can see, this is a single Go file that also exposes a surface. And the idea here is that we have this function, which is a sort of a helper function to call our analytics service that I just showed you. And that creates a request to that analytics service. So it sends some JSON because that's what you do in the in REST interface, right? And the actual behavior of this particular service is that you can upload a video and then it can encode it. Now, I didn't build any of that stuff. Basically, the only thing I did was a time.sleep to simulate a sort of processing. Uh, but the only thing it does after that is called the analytics service. So you have this one service where you upload videos and another service where you store some analytics about that. And as you can see, using different programming languages. And this is actually quite common, right? If you have very complex systems, not everybody is going to use Python because that's not going to be convenient. In fact, when you look at the third example here, which is a web client, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense to build that in Python, even though you have, of course, several packages in the Python ecosystem to build web interfaces. The more common way to do it is to use JavaScript or TypeScript. So I have a simple web client here that has source code, which is in this case, a JavaScript file. There's also a couple of basic tests here, some styling, basic stuff you would want to do in a web framework. But the basic thing that this does is that there is an app and it allows you to upload something. And that actually calls our encoding service, which then in turn will use the analytics service. And all of this is handled via REST interfaces, right here, it's a post request, for example. REST stands for representational state transfer. This is not a protocol, a standard, or a framework. It's more of an architectural style or a convention. And you can implement REST in a variety of ways. This defines a consistent, uniform interface for interaction between clients and servers. If you want to dig deeper, there's a website, restfulapi.net, that covers everything actually quite well. So I recommend that you take a look at that. Now, what's nice about REST is that this is commonly used. It's widely adopted, so that's really a strength and that means also as a developer, you can more easily get into projects that rely on a REST interface because they most likely follow the same standards. Although put versus patch versus post, not everybody is doing that consistently. Now, I am actually personally quite biased towards using REST interfaces because, well, that's the thing I've used the most and that's what I'm the most comfortable with. REST and gRPC are actually quite different. In particular, gRPC allows for some things that REST simply can't do. I'll talk more about that later on. And this comes with its own problems. Of course, we are in the field of software development, but REST also has problems. Now, this video is not an in-depth technical tutorial on how to build a gRPC application. I just wanna look at it from a higher level and try to answer the question, should you use it? So first, RPC in gRPC stands for Remote Procedure Call. And this is language agnostic. 
In a distributed system, one system triggers a procedure to execute on another system. And RPC is a mechanism for doing that. So it follows a request response protocol. The client initiates an RPC by sending a request message to a known remote server, asking it to execute a specific procedure with given parameters. That server then processes the request and sends a response back to the client, allowing the application to continue. RPC itself has been widely used in distributed computing for many years with various implementations. The G in RPC stands for General Purpose or Google. Not really sure which of those two. And it's also a library that comes with some default implementations and tools. For one, this uses HTTP as a transport protocol, more specifically HTTP2, which actually can be a problem, more about that later, and protocol buffers as the interface description language. That's different from REST, where you would typically use JSON data. And by the way, you can also use JSON data with gRPC if you wanted to. It's just that protocol buffers are an implementation that comes out of the box. Now, advantage of protocol buffers is that this is actually smaller than JSON, and that also makes it faster than JSON. Furthermore, the gRPC framework also provides features such as authentication, bidirectional streaming, and a few other things as well. Now, the way it works is different from REST, because in order to use gRPC, you will generate code based on a proto file, which acts as a contract of how data is written between clients and servers, between different services. Let me show you an example of what I mean. So here I have the gRPC implementation of the services that I've shown you before. So in the case of the analytics service, for example, we have, again, a main file, which is just like before a setup that uses a SQL alchemy interface to a SQLite database. However, the interface to the outside world is actually different because there's now an analytics service class. And that relies on generated code. And that's actually in this subfolder. So like I said, this is based on proto files. And this is an example of what such a file looks like. So this is that file for the analytics service. So as you can see, there is a service definition. There is a remote procedure call named logview. And that's accepting a logview request and going to return a logview response. And there are also different messages. And these messages are specified here. So a logview request has a video name and a logview response has a success Boolean value. And as you can see here, we have code that is generated by gRPC. And in this particular project, I'm using gRPC IO as a dependency to manage that part of the framework. So we have this code that's now being generated, and that is what the service actually relies on. Now, similarly, there's also the encoding service, which is built in Go, but that actually relies on the same proto file. So there's the analytics proto file and the encoding proto file in this case. And you can actually see this in this updated Go file where it relies on these two different services. And again, this is code that's being generated by the gRPC framework. So this is for the analytics part and this is for the encoding part. Now, like I said, I'm not going to dive into too many details here. It's more of a high level video, but the main concept that you should remember is that gRPC generates code from these proto files and the proto files specify the interface, the contract that the services adhere to. And then he even went a step further and also used gRPC for the web client. So there you can also generate JavaScript files, JavaScript code for these particular types of services. So we have analytics and encoding. So then how did I actually generate all this code? Well, that's what the gRPC service does. And the way that I organize this is that I created a make file to do this job for me. And there you can see how that actually works. So Proto-C is the tool you install if you want to use gRPC, and that actually generates the code for you. And for the Python analytics service, you can actually use gRPC tools, which is one of the other dependencies that I installed. And then you also have access to Proto-C, and that will generate the code for you. And as you can see, I passed some information here, like uh, what the out folder is for the Python code, what proto file to use, et cetera, et cetera. And same for the web client. So also there I'm using the proto C CLI in order to generate that code. And then what happens is that if you update your spec, if you update your contract in the proto file, let's say you add another message type or another remote procedure, 
then you can actually run this code generation bit again. It's going to regenerate the code for you. And then your service has that as an available option. One thing that I mentioned in the beginning of this video is that gRPC uses HTTP2. And that means that you actually, if for a web client like this one, you're actually going to need a proxy. Because at the moment, most browsers only support HTTP 1.1. And this is why I'm using the gRPC web package that does that for us. So that's a slight complication. One thing you'll probably notice if you look at the generated code for the gRPC web client example, is that this actually looks pretty com complicated. It's not like a simple uh, uh, REST request or something. And that's because there's actually a proxy involved. And also kind of shows that gRPC is actually not really intended for this type of server client communication, but more for communication between services. And by the way, if you want to become more comfortable making architectural decisions like this, check out my free architecture checklist. This will help you avoid make costly mistakes. Go to iron.com slash checklist to grab your copy. The link is also in the description of this video. So how does gRPC versus REST actually affect your design? Well, first, gRPC is really surface oriented. The client asks the server to perform a function that might impact some server resources like storage, queues, things like that. But this might not be a client in a way that you're thinking about this. A client can be simply service A that calls service B. And then service A is the client and service B is the server. That could also be the other way around. It doesn't mean that a client in a browser makes that call. Now REST, on the other hand, is really entity oriented. The typical CRUD interface, create, read, update, and delete. And then the server has resources that it manages in that way. And in REST, everything is focused around these entities. And that's even translated into the different verbs that you're using, right? Get, post, patch, and delete. And in that sense, it's pretty open. I mean, there are some conventions to follow, but if your API decides to use post for updating a resource rather than put, it's not perfect, but it's okay. Whereas gRPC kind of forces you to align with certain principles, like a single responsibility, you know, each gRPC service focus on one task, which makes it easier to maintain and debug. Also, gRPC enforces these very strict contracts through the protocol buffers. So there are clear boundaries. And that also results in encapsulation because it hides service implementation details behind these contracts. And that reduces the risk of side effects from internal changes. Now, the thing is, this is not just gRPC. You can still do this by following REST conventions and style. Mainly the thing that gRPC gives you is the interface by using the proto files and the tooling to generate the code for you and set it all up. But even with all this stuff that you get for free with gRPC, there are some problems with it. First, it's tightly coupled. Mainly if you have two services that communicate, they each need the same proto file, which is used to generate the code. And then also, brings up a question, like if you have a microservice architecture and you want to keep things decoupled, on a repository level, where do you store these proto files? So one solution is that you simply duplicate them. So you have the same proto file in multiple services, but of course that's not great because if you change one proto file, but you forget to change the other, then it doesn't work anymore. Another solution is to follow kind of the monolith style where you keep all your microservices in the same repository. That is kind of what I've been doing here. So I have my various services in different folders and I have another folder with proto files. And the third solution is that you sort of do it independently and store the proto files in a separate repo and which then gets accessed by each individual service repository. Honestly, I'm not really sure which of these solutions is the best. If you know of another approach, let me know in the comments. Now, what is nice about gRPC is that since you generate code from the proto file, you get this single source of truth where every service needs to comply with this definition rather than interpreting it like you would need to do with a REST interface. Now, another thing that I noticed that specifically in the Python example, if you take a look at the code that's actually been generated, there are actually no type annotations, nothing whatsoever. And that's kind of concerning because that means that the code that's generated actually doesn't integrate all that well into your regular Python code, if you're a type annotation junkie like myself, that is. Now, another thing about gRPC is that it uses HTTP2, which means that you can do a bit more with it, like multiplexing requests or multiple requests can be sent over the same connection without blocking. And that actually makes gRPC faster. 
especially if you have a real-time or low latency use case. And with gRPC, both the client and the server can send a continuous stream of messages allowing for full duplex communication. This makes it a great solution for scenarios that require real-time data exchange like uh, chat applications or Internet of Things systems. REST is simply not designed for this. Now, REST, on the other hand, is pretty loosely coupled. The internal details are not shared between client and server. But that also comes with the problem that because there is no definite contract between these services, it's also easy to break. If there's a typo in a request that you send to a service, well, the service is going to respond with an error. You also won't get typing support while you're working on the different parts. For example, the, the client doesn't know what types of things the server expects. So that's something that you as developer need to figure out by looking at the code or at the documentation of the REST interface. And this is why bigger products often don't just offer the REST interface, but they also have an SDK that provides more language-specific advantages and makes it a lot easier to work with the API. Uh, Stripe is a great example of this. They have an SDK for different languages, including Python. So you don't directly call the REST API, but you have a usable interface on top of that. Another issue with REST is performance. It can introduce overhead with verbose HTTP requests, headers, different payload formats, especially when you're working with larger sets of data or deeply nested resources. Also, the standard HTTP methods like get, post, delete, etc., can be restrictive if you want to perform more complex action that doesn't exactly fit CRUD operation, though the typical convention is to just use a POST request in that case. And finally, REST is not designed for real-time communication or push notification. That means you need an additional solution like a WebSocket or long polling. And by the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, you'd like to watch more of my content, make sure to give this video a like. I'd really appreciate that. And subscribe to the channel. So to answer the question, should you use gRPC? I'm going to say it depends. It's probably not the definitive answer you were hoping for, but it really depends because I think it's valuable for internal usage and services like communication between microservices, even though you still should minimize communication to keep these services decoupled and not end up with a distributed monolith. But even if you use it for that, you might not like the proto format and you're also dependent on the gRPC code generation system. Like I said in Python, it could do a lot better, especially related to type annotations. Now, for external usage, if you have, let's say, a backend service or a group of microservices and there's an API gateway and you need to communicate with a browser, then I'd say skip gRPC and follow the REST convention. REST is more human readable, which is nice. It's also more flexible. Even though it may not be as optimized as gRPC, it's also really easy to use. And in some cases, you might want to combine both approaches. For example, your internal services might communicate via gRPC to handle intensive tasks, but the same functionality might be exposed via REST to external clients, and that provides a more familiar interface. But to be honest, I'm on the fence about this, but I'm also biased towards REST because that's what I mainly worked with until now, and I haven't encountered a situation where performance was so crucial that REST simply didn't make the cut. But I'd like to know what you think. Is gRPC something that you're planning to use? Or do you use it already? What did you learn from using it? Let me know in the comments. A technology that I haven't talked at all about in this video is GraphQL. Where does that fit in? And when does it make sense to use it? Is it still something you should use at all? To learn more about GraphQL, watch this video next. Thanks for watching and see you next time.